Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we're here in Salem at the Salem Museum with one of my favorite authors, a masterful storyteller, Sharon McCrum. She has so many awards to her name and we can't wait to chat with her. And in her words, she's a speaker for the dead. She meticulously researches every detail of her books and we're going to have a chance to chat with her about her process. So Sharon, thanks so much for joining us here at the beautiful Salem Museum. Yes. And this was actually a choice of yours for a book launch, wasn't it? It was. The Prayers the Devil Answers, which came out in 2016, we had the premiere here and people came from about eight states. Wonderful. That's wonderful. So growing up at, in Appalachia, and you are a wonderful ap um, ambassador for Appalachia because you actually take our story, share it all over the world, don't you? Because your books yes. are used. How are they used? Um, taught in classes for one thing, mm -hmm. um, in surprising places. The Hispanic Relations class at the University of Colorado taught The Ballad of Frankie Silver, which is about a young mountain girl who was hanged for murder in the 19th century. But the reason the Hispanic Relations class taught it was because she was a minority culture sure. person being tried in the majority culture and there was this misunderstanding between the two cultures and so that they completely misread what happened and the Hispanic kids identified with Frankie and said that happens to us too. Mm, what's it like to research a book like that? Usually when you're researching books that deal with people who weren't famous you have to go back to primary sources if you can find them because nobody's written any books about them and they don't make it into the history books. Mm -hmm. And those are the people I like to write about. That's why I call myself a speaker for the dead. I find these people who had an interesting life or played a part in history, but they weren't recorded. They didn't have a biographer. And so I conjure them up in my mind and say, if you could talk to people now, what would you want them to know? Oh, interesting. So I'm curious, when you're conjuring that up, are you looking for clues about their life that then helps you piece those characters together? Yes, what, what, was, what, was, what were their life and times like? What, what did they feel about the experience that they went through? Mm. For example, uh, in The Unquiet Grave, the mother discovers that her daughter was murdered and she takes it upon herself to go confront the prosecutor and tell him that she wants justice for her daughter. Now that was hmm. a remarkably brave thing to do in, in 1897, an era when women could not even vote. So right. what is going through her mind? What gives her the courage to do that? Mm. Well, and your body of work is so vast. So these stories, like with The Unquiet Grave and Prayers the Devil Answers, you take these details, these pieces of truth, and you piece everything together so yes. beautifully. So then colleges are using them to research, to tell stories. And I know they've been translated into multiple languages. Yes. So all over the world, people are gleaning little bits of our history right here. And these people who, unbeknownst to us, have become famous because you've told their stories and yes. shared those with the world. So if we go back to a young Sharon McCrum, what advice did you get from your mom? I read somewhere that there were these unwritten rules because your parents were really different and your mom had these unwritten rules that you knew you had to follow. What were they? My parents came both from North Carolina, so you would think they would be the same culture. But my father was descended from the Scots-Irish pioneers who settled the mountains in the 1700s and he had ancestors who fought in the American Revolution. Mm. My mother's family was Tidewater, the southern uh, gone with the wind steel magnolias. Right. Um, <laughs> True southern culture. bell, right? <laughs> yes. So their rules are things like thou shalt not wear white shoes after Labor Day. Mm. But all the good stories came from the mountain side of the family. Uh -oh. I didn't want to write Jane Austen with an attitude. Mm -hmm. So I discovered all the wonderful little historical stories that that were lurking in the mountains. King's Mountain is the story of a battle in the American Revolution that very seldom makes the history books, 
but Thomas Jefferson called it the turning point of the war, mm. and I had an ancestor in that battle, so I wrote about the battle. It happened near Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, really? So there's a little genealogy going through these stories, too. Yes, sometimes, although I don't write about my ancestors because I'm related to them. Mm -hmm. if the, in that book, my ancestor is, has the most minor of parts. I think he has two speaking parts in the book because he wasn't as interesting as some of the other guys in the battle. Right, and your grandfathers were preachers? Uh, Great-grandfathers. Great-grandfathers were preachers. What was that like growing up? Well, they were gone by then. Okay, so is that where the storytelling, you think the storytelling yeah. just kind of comes through that? I, that that whole oral culture, yes. And storytelling is also part of the oral culture of the Scots and the Irish because mm -hmm. they didn't write things down in the old days. But what they wanted to do is to transmit the values of the society down to younger people through storytelling. Mm -hmm. And the way they did that, that there were five rules that maybe unconsciously went into every story. You define a people, who are we, where do we come from? You describe a place, okay. what, what place do we identify with ourselves? You record history, mm -hmm. because if you don't know what happened, it might happen again. Right. You transmit cultural values. Mm. What do we hold with? What do we honor? Loyalty, bravery, thriftiness, mm -hmm. what, are, what are our touchstones? And the last one though, the most important maybe, is to entertain. Hmm. Because if your story is not entertaining, if it's not captivating, then you might tell it to the next generation, but they won't retell it. Mm -hmm. And so all those values you put in the story will be lost unless it's a good story. Mm, and it grabs the reader, which yes. is what you do throughout all of your work. And do you find that as you're writing a story, um, and how long does it take, by the way, to do the research to put a book together? Um, I start out with an idea and don't know everything about the time and the place necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so, well, every book is different, really, depending on what it is you want to know. Um, I've had, to, with the Ballad of Frankie Silver, the first woman hanged for murder in the state of North Carolina, one of the things was that we were on English common law mm. in North Carolina in the 1830s. Mm. So I had to fly to London and talk to British barristers really? to find out what the old British common laws were. Mm -hmm. And that explained to me things like why she was un unable to testify in the trial. Defendants could not testify under English common law. Hmm. Um, I've done things like um, read trial transcripts, of course, for the Ballad of Tom Dooley. I read the trial transcripts, and I got a real attorney, Bill Pfeffercorn from Winston-Salem, to read it sort of in his mind, second chairing the attorney mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. 1866 trial, and I said, what would you have done differently? Did he do a good job? Did he mess up? Wow, so that attention to detail is wonderful. And that's what makes, I think, all of your work so compelling. When, I'm curious, so when you're putting together a book and you find a subject or you hear a story, yes. what happens inside when you're like, this is my next one? This you is know, what I wanna tell. People are always coming up and saying, I have a great story for you, and that never works. <laughs> because I get about three ideas for stories a week. Mm. I get ideas that are so good that if you write the book, I'd go out and buy it. But it's gonna take two years of my life to right. do a book. And so I've learned over the years that the only stories I have to write are the ones that won't go away. Mm. What does that mean? You get an idea and you think, well, I'm busy and I don't, but it keeps coming back, it keeps haunting you. And so, like that gnawing feeling inside, yes, I just can't let it go. The only way to get rid of it yeah. is to write it. <laughs> okay. And it's like, okay, I'll get this one out of my system and we'll go ahead and write it and research it. And yes. So do you have a team of people that help you research or are you kind of doing this on your own? I have had people to help me. It, it, it isn't as if I have a team and it's a permanent thing, but from time to time I've gotten help from people. Um, in the Tom Dooley story, it happened about 10 miles from a local community college. 
And so I put together a group of people who were just as interested in the story as I oh, was. Oh, that's a great idea. So because Tom Dooley was a soldier in the Civil War, I got a Civil War historian mm -hmm. to find his military record. I got a local genealogist mm -hmm. to find out who was related to who. Got another local historian to find the maps of where everything happened and so on. And then when the book came out, we had a seminar at the community college and about 600 people came wow. and we all went up on the stage one by one and talked about what we researched and what we found and then at, at the end of the session that afternoon we put the attendees into college vans and took them down and showed them the graves oh, and where Laura Foster experience. was killed. Wow, what a wonderful experience. Yes. Did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Yes, in the second grade when the rest of the class was evenly divided between cowboys and stewardesses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was the one who said, I'm going to be a writer, and nobody believed me. Oh, really? What did they say? The kids or the teachers or everyone, they thought it was just a passing fancy? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, but I kept reading and, and writing silly little stories in number two pencils on mm -hmm. lined paper, but it, that process of writing even when you don't have much to say and you're eight years old. I compare to say Michael Jordan when he was four feet 11 making free throws and missing most of them because he's four feet 11. Right. But the point is that he did it every day. Yeah, practice, practice, practice. Yes. Knew it was right in his heart, just like the writing's right there in your heart. But, but the thing about writing is there's, there's more to it than ideas and expression. There's there's um, grammatical points, when to use a semicolon, there's flashbacks, there's all sorts of technical things. So again, my analogy is, if you're gonna drive a stick shift, practice in the yard before you go out on the interstate. Exactly, for safety for all of us. Yes. So let's go back to that for a second with all the, the drafts and the revisions and the technical part of the story because you're right, the story is one piece, but that technical part of what you put in is a, is a second piece. Um, were you, for instance, going through revision after revision after revision, or do you edit along the way? Do you get I edit along the way, okay. yes. I know there are people who write the whole book and then go back to page one and rewrite, and to me that's like the week after Thanksgiving. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So what I do is, I try to write 500 words a day when I'm working on something. And so I'll go in, and you can't just start cold. So I'll read the 500 words that I wrote yesterday, and then I'll see when there have been repeated words or a sentence is not smooth enough, and I'll go and fix all the little things wrong with yesterday. Mm -hmm. Then that puts me back in the mood that I need to be in to, to do today's words, but the other thing is that I've already edited yesterday's. Oh, that, so that's nice. It's like you're kind of keeping up with your homework all the way through the process. So when I finish, I'm finished. How long do you spend every day doing writing or and or that, researching? That depends on where you are in the book. If I can do 500 words in an hour, then I'll go watch Supernatural reruns. But if it takes me until 8 o'clock at night, I'll still be in the office. Oh, so you kind of keep that 500 word um, per day as your, you know, your gauge yeah. of where can, you're going to go. I can do, I guess my record is 5,000 words in a day when I had one big scene mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. But most of the time, if I try to do more than 500 words, then it ends up being a mess and I throw it out anyway. So, so do you storyboard or outline or are you, uh, no. no. So you no. just sit down, uh, computer, pen and paper, computer. pencil? Computer, okay. yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't know anybody anymore except poets right. who write in longhand. Yeah. So when you're finding ideas, let's say you're out and about, you're shopping, you're somewhere, and you think, oh, this might be an interesting thing to add to that book. Is your mind always going when you're outside of your I guess it your, is, but it takes time? two ideas to make a book. Okay, what are they? The, the first idea is something that you can get from anywhere. I mean, I've heard stories at a dinner party that would make good stories. Mm -hmm. But it has to resonate with something inside yourself. That's that gnawing feeling you were talking about. So, for about. example, yeah. if you were Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. Charles Dickens had a terrible childhood and ended up in the workhouse and, and having to work in a boot blacking factory at the age of 10 or so. Mm -hmm. 
So in Charles Dickens's heart is this pre-adolescent boy who is suffering and starving. Mm -hmm. And that little boy turns up over and over in Dickens' work. You're right. The plots are different, but Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, Pip, and Great Expectations, that little boy is always there. Mm -hmm. If he had written The Hunt for Red October, there would have been a kid on that submarine <laughs> saying, please, can I have some more? Right, right. And so my inside idea is not the suffering little boy. It is the view of the outsider. Hmm. It is, is the idea of not quite belonging where you are. And so I always look for the the, per, the odd man out, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And the underdog maybe in some respects, right? That person, that's interesting. So in that thread weaving through your book is where you said earlier, you know, these are people that no one might not know about, but yet there's a legend attached to them and then you just kind of start digging through the process. Yeah, and, and find the, the I know where that odd man out came from. It's where? back to my parents. Mm -hmm. My father was from the mountain culture of North Carolina and my mother was the Tidewater aristocracy. Therefore, whichever parent I imitated, the yeah. other one thought it was hilarious. Right. You know, sterling silver and Debussy yeah. versus the rustic mountain Right, in the mountain cabin and the yeah. heart of Appalachia. Yeah. Mm. In a way, you share Appalachia with the entire world through your work, now through the, your books being translated, being used in colleges. Um, what are some of the most interesting things you found in your research, a trail that maybe tr truly surprised you that was unexpected? Um, I guess the reaction of people. There, there are a couple of things that people need to know. One is deliverance was not a documentary. So I'll find people who, who don't seem to realize that it's not 1897 here anymore. They're, they realize that you can no longer buy a steak for 10 cents a pound in New York. They don't have gas lights and the streetcars are not pulled by horses. But yet they think all those things were true in New York City when the Appalachia that they picture existed. Mm, the log okay. cabins and all that. And the second thing is, and I said this in a book called She Walks These Hills, cities are judged by their richest inhabitants. Rural areas are judged by their poorest. Hmm. So I have so, people, Let's think about that for a second. You're right. Yeah. So the poorest areas, or the rural areas are judged by the poorest. The cities are judged by the richest. Yes. So that preconceived notion yes. of just living in Appalachia, the mountain people, the stories. I have huh. friends who take their helicopters to Bristol to watch the NASCAR race. Right. But when you're talking about Appalachia, people aren't picturing them. Mm -hmm. There are houses whose prices around Abingdon would make your nose bleed. Hmm. They don't picture that. They're picturing these 1890s shacks. Right. But there are a lot of people who could buy and sell you with their lunch money. Do you find a particular value system when you when you write about the, the people and the culture of Appalachia that maybe is misunderstood when you go to speak or you share stories from the region? I think most of the people who have tried to speak for Appalachia, even up to, to yesterday, we're not from Appalachia. And mm. so what you're getting is that National Geographic thing exactly. of, oh, look at this yep. weird little foreign culture. I will be your interpreter. And it's, I thought it was time that the people from the culture started speaking for themselves. Mm -hmm. When you were growing up, you knew you wanted to be a writer. Were you also an avid reader? Oh, yes, a book a day. Really? Yes. A book a day? Yes. Oh, who are some of your favorites? Um, let's see. The 19th century authors, I liked Kipling, I liked uh, Mark Twain, Emily Bronte. Mm -hmm. How about Jane today? Austen. How much do you read? How much do you read today? Are you still on a book a day or what no, are you doing? I don't have time for yeah. a book a day. <laughs> no, a lot of what I read today has to be nonfiction for research. Sure. Are your, are your children writers? No. Okay. No, I have one scientist and one who is a computer and graphics person. Oh, nice. Yes. So My husband is, a, is an in, environmental engineer. So they had their choice between arts and sciences. Right, it's kind of that same thing as your family then, right? I mean, you had, your mom was 
was the Southern Belle and your dad was, you know, a part of the Appalachian mountain well, he's culture. He's a college professor with a master's degree from Columbia. So Wonderful. let's not stereotype yeah. him. No, either. I'm saying, I think growing up, you were saying that, you know, the, the difference between the both when you took on to your mom's side or you or you would imitate your dad. It's like now with you too, I, the creative I'm a engineer. Right. I see that. I am the combination. My father loved the storytelling and the music and all the cultural things from his side of the family. But on the other hand, I've got one of the best collections of 18th century silver wow. this side of London. What a wonderful time and, and what a wonderful experience growing up. What has been important to you with your own children to make sure that as you're raising them with such a rich background um, and environment that they, that they move forward in their adult lives with? I wanted them to have adventures. And so we traveled a lot mm. and I didn't want them to just go cold into a situation. So when, once when they were six and seven, we were gonna go to Ireland for the summer. And so what I did leading up to it was I got bunches of Irish folk songs and played them for the kids in the car for months before we left. And so when we got to a place, like we're in Dublin, right. we're on a bridge over the river, and I started singing, and the Angelus bells or the Liffey <laughs> swells. And I said, that's the Liffey, that river. Oh, what a wonderful experience. So it meant something. It sure did. Well, your books mean so much. Let's transition a little bit and talk about The Unquiet Grave um, and Prayers the Devil Answers. These two stories in particular are based in facts, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what was it about the Prayers the Devil Answers that you thought, you know... So maybe some people have gotten this wrong, but I need to get it right in order to tell the story. In that one, I actually departed quite a bit from the actual story. It happened in 1936, as I said it did, in Kentucky. I moved it to Tennessee, and, cha and the only thing I really kept in that book was the fact that it was the last public hanging in America, and that the sheriff who had to physically perform the hanging was a woman. Mm, okay. How about with The Unquiet Grave? In The Unquiet Grave, I kept everything just as accurate as I possibly could. I didn't change anything. Hmm. Because I discovered that that story had always been told as a folk tale. Hmm. And in folk tales, when things get complicated, because it's a five minute thing while your marshmallow browns, what they <laughs> do is, they smooth out all the complexities so they can go quickly. Okay. And I had 100,000 words to work with, so I didn't have to smooth out the complexities. Mm -hmm. I could find out why things didn't seem to make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I researched every person in that case through to the end of their lives wow. to find out what happened to them. This was the only case in America in which the ghost of a murdered woman, or the ghost of a murder victim, testified against the killer, or was responsible for the conviction of the killer. Would you read a passage for us? Yes. Um, the killer was convicted. His name was Edward Erasmus Shue, and in 1897, after the trial, he was sentenced to life in prison in Moundsville, which was then the state penitentiary of West Virginia. He was sentenced there for murdering his wife, Zona. He had told people that she had fallen down the stairs and broken her neck, but in fact, he had strangled her, he throttled her. So here he is in the prison thinking back. How could he have forgotten the cold? The cells had no heat and no light. In summer, the prisoners sweltered in the humid, airless stench, and in the winter, the coal seeped into their bones until even their thoughts slowed down, and they couldn't sleep because every movement under the thin blanket was a reminder that no matter what you did, how you turned or lay or tried to wrap your arms around yourself, you would still be cold. There was some consolation in knowing that the rest of his life wasn't going to be that long. He hadn't minded the fever, because at least it kept him from feeling the cold, but the blood disgusted him and frightened him. He could, he could not see it when he coughed at night, but he could feel the thick, warm fluid on his thumb and his forefinger, 
and even in the dark he knew it was not phlegm. In the daytime, when he worked and ate in the company of the other prisoners, he heard the coughing and saw the pink-stained rags with which they staunched it. Consumption. The prison doctors, helpless to treat it, solved the problem by ignoring it. It's only a bad cold, they would say. Come spring, you'll feel better. He knew better, though. He didn't suppose it mattered. He was, for all intents and purposes, dead already. And mured here in a tomb-side cell, alone in the dark, it was worse than dying, really, because he could still feel things, still shiver and starve and suffer. The dead knew nothing, felt no pain, and had nothing more to fear. It didn't seem fair. Here he was, shut away in the cold dark in a stone coffin, while Zona, who was supposed to be dead and gone, was apparently out and about, talking to people and appearing wherever she wanted to. Where was the justice in that? Mm. Wow. Where was the justice in that? And I've been in that cell. You have. It's a, just a little bit longer than the bed. So if he was six feet tall, he would have maybe four inches if he laid out straight. And he could have put his hand on either wall oh. and touched it. So it was just about the size of a coffin. Mm. It had no light and it was not heated. And that, that prison is two blocks from the Ohio River. So you can imagine in the winter, the yes. cold and the damp. Yes. Oh. And you're in the dark, freezing. So we're going to have to leave it right there. This was such a wonderful experience. And thank you so much for sharing your work and your process and your books with us. And if you would like to know more about The Unquiet Grave and Prayers the Devil Answers, please check us out online for a little bit of an extended conversation. I want to give special thanks to Sharon and our friends at the Salem Museum for their wonderful hospitality. And I'll see you next time right around the corner.